In the first practice video, we reminded ourselves why we are practicing and how being aware of this why can help us to be deliberate about our time at the keyboard. Yes, we need to run through pieces to practice performance, but running through things shouldn't take up the majority of our time in practice, because then the likelihood becomes high that at some point we are inadvertently solidifying mistakes rather than fixing them, which can make our playing less secure and less enjoyable to both us and anybody listening. Also, remember myelin? As our brain produces myelin, reinforcing connections in response to our practice, repeating the same mistake over and over again can actually cause us to strengthen the incorrect highways of communication, quite literally ingraining a mistake. So let's avoid that as much as possible. Firstly, Mythbuster time. We've all heard the nice round number of 10,000 hours for practice as being necessary to make one a master of something, but that nice round number isn't precisely true. 10,000 is just the average number of hours a bunch of violin students in one particular study had practiced by the age of 20. Yes, the time invested is important, but this study actually emphasized the quality of practice, deliberate practice, not time spent. Researchers actually haven't yet found a strong, consistent relationship between the quantity of practice time and the quality of performance. So we want to improve the quality of our practice time based on these data. Before even starting to practice, let's set ourselves up for success through two steps, each leading to the next. Step one, set goals and determine what motivates you. As we did in the first video, we can learn to or remind ourselves to enjoy practice, as well as describe our short and long-term goals. These goals and reasons to practice motivate us to continue, and knowing them allows us to go to step two, create expectations for ourselves based on these goals and use them to plan out the next practice session. I keep a notebook with me so that I can write down what I need to or expect to accomplish, keeping track of things that I need to work on and planning my practice time. This practice log can be absolutely anything that you need. I know what I've worked on, often the amount of time that I spent working on it, the speed to which I've gotten a difficult bit so I don't have to sit down and try and remember, and I plan out the next practice session. Now when I'm planning, I don't make an exact schedule of at 10 a.m. 45 minutes of Bach, but I do note the spots that I want to catch the next time, ideas of how to practice tough spots during the next day's session, and I list everything that I need to work on the next day, noting particular goals that I would like to accomplish. I also use this notebook to clear my mind of distractions. I write down anything that's threatening my concentration, things to do, errands to run, emails to send, other things to practice, so that these aren't nibbling at the edges of my thoughts and keeping me from the task at hand. Then, this list is right there waiting for me so I can attend to it when I'm done, and I don't have to try to remember it. Now that we've set our goals, created expectations, and done a little planning, let's look at making practice efficient. The number one thing you can do while practicing is to listen, something that Charles-Marie Vidor of the famous Toccata often wrote about. The organist is a conductor. In order to play well, he must know how to conduct, and both organist and conductor need the same gift of knowing how to listen and how to make themselves heard. If we as players are not listening, shaping, and reacting to the sounds that we make, how can we expect anybody else to? We have to begin strengthening this muscle of listening to our playing in real time during practice, using it to discover potential problems and sort them out, all for the greatest goal of making music. From the very first note, use this skill of listening to play musically. Notice the piece's construction, listen to and note surprising harmonic progressions, make certain rests are receiving their due, since the music is both the notes and the spaces between them and avoid playing robotically, although an unsteady tempo is not an excuse for musicality. Even at a slow practice tempo, we need to be cognizant of how we're connecting the notes, showing how some are more important than others. During practice, we're striving to learn music, ideally step by step and slowly to incur a minimum number of mistakes right off the bat. Vidal said, it is not muscular effort that the modern organ requires, but a formidable and constant expenditure of mental energy, which comes from using our brains as we practice, consciously choosing the right tool for the job at hand. 
The energy for this deliberate practice can be maintained through the interleaving practice that I spoke about in the first video, varying what you are doing rather than mechanically checking off a list of things to do. So here are some tools to help. Tool number one, your memory stick. My pencil will always remember better than I do, especially months and years after I've learned a piece. Write down the phrasing idea, the fingering, the articulation. Your brain will respond to this visual cue. Tool number two, divide and conquer. Divide the piece into sections, by line, by phrase, whatever works for you, so you can tackle one part at a time rather than the whole. I'll talk even more about this in the next video, so stay tuned. Tool three, fingerings. Start with them when learning a new piece, and ideally use a score without someone else's or an editor's fingering so that you can use those that best fit your unique hands and feel natural. Don't reinvent the wheel. If a piece is full of C major scales and you play those comfortably with one fingering, use that one unless there is a strong reason not to. You've already learned it. Consistency is key. The most general fingering advice I can give is think of where you're going, and where you're coming from. Think on both sides of the little bit that you're trying to finger. The point of departure and the destination will guide you. This observation of context, as well as finding spots where only one fingering is possible, like chords or points of arrival, will often limit the fingering choice from what seems unlimited to perhaps one to three logical options. Then your hands can tell you what feels best and you move on to the next fingering challenge. Also, remember, the largest gap between your fingers is between your pointer finger and your thumb. When playing an octave or a big reach, the hand will almost always be more relaxed if you just open it up primarily in that joint, rather than trying to make the fingers evenly, but unnaturally, distant from each other. Tool four, slow practice. To prevent mistakes from happening in the first place, the cliche is cliche for a reason. If you can't play it slowly, then you can't play it quickly. Although I really did try to keep proving this wrong throughout my teens. Vidor thought this too. All unjustified movement is a waste of time and strength. Before deciding that a movement is inevitable, its usefulness must have been ascertained during the period of slow practice. That period should be lengthy. If you have the courage and conscience to make yourself do it, considerable time will be gained, and then you will play every virtuoso piece in its exact tempo without difficulty. Without difficulty sounds really good to me. Tool five, use your metronome to control your speed, putting rhythm into perspective from a slow tempo at which you can play a section perfectly. This keeps you honest, stopping an easier section from inadvertently going too quickly, and helps you to hear any little notes that might be rushing. Slowly increase this tempo, writing down the speeds that you reach, either in the score or in your practice notebook. When you discover problems, turn off the metronome, discover why it's problematic, and use one or several other tools here or that you've discovered or used on your own to solve them. Tool six, a question. Parts together or parts apart? You've probably heard the two schools of thought here that are complete opposites and both defended equally passionately. My philosophy, your initial study of a piece should, should actually be parts together because this is how you will ultimately be playing, we hope. <laughs> this helps your ear to start learning how the harmonies will sound. Then when you choose to play parts separately or to leave one part out, have a reason for doing so. You wanna to listen to that internal line, you wanna study how the left hand moves, you wanna work on pedal phrasing, check a wrong note. Just please don't do parts together or parts apart solely to check off a box, as that is the opposite of deliberate practice. Tool seven, learning for scalar passages. We can trick our brain into dividing difficult runs into manageable parts through applying rhythms, which works both for new notes being learned for the first time and also for relearning old notes. I swear by these methods, they have helped me so many times when I've needed to play a piece as soon as possible. So first, and as quickly as possible, change of eighth notes or 16th notes in an even numbered time signature, duples. We want our fingers to be independent and strong and dotted rhythms can help to encourage that. So this is dotted rhythms all together. Dots in one hand against the other hand playing evenly. There are 
four ways to do this. students who have finger independence but who have trouble landing on big beats concisely. So here are two methods to encourage the hands to work together and also to help you notice when some notes are rushing. Next. We have all the exciting possibilities for dotted rhythms that help to even out triplets with hands doing them together. And one hand remaining even while the other dots. We have six options here. Tool eight is for learning big strings of chords. We organists play a lot of chordal passages, which can be even more difficult than scalar ones. So in a section with a string of chords, whether legato or separated, try playing each chord comfortably, lifting and moving quickly to the next one, hovering over it to be certain that you've arrived before you play it. Follow each finger. Watch what each individual finger does, playing it alone or simply watching. Is your fourth finger really using the most efficient route to the next note, or is it taking a moment on the other side of the world when it's on its way there? This works well for feet too. The right foot doesn't have to hang out doing nothing while the left foot plays. It can already be traveling to its next destination. Play all but one voice of the chord separated, practicing the smooth motion of that one voice that's not playing as separated with the fingering you've written. If that finger must lift between legato notes because it plays two notes in a row, hold it longer than the others and then move it quickly to the next one, practicing efficient motion. Tool nine, for lots of leaps. Isolate one leap at a time and practice just that one. Then add a note before, a note afterwards, close your eyes and visualize the keyboard and that leap. Practice it that way until you trust your mind's eye. Even use the rhythms that we've just talked about to practice a chain of quick leaps so that it can happen through your muscle memory and you trust it to do so. Tool 10 is a process for identifying and using all of these tools, as well as others that you already know about or might discover, to fix mistakes, which we do occasionally need to do. Although we tend to think practice makes perfect, it can't. Even Yo-Yo Ma says, of course you cannot achieve perfection, and you kind of get paralyzed, so you have to find an equilibrium between the possible, what's realistic and what is ideal. We are only human, so let's first give, give ourselves permission to make mistakes, deciding to never judge ourselves for them. If one crops up, especially in practice, it's an opportunity, not a flaw. Using the skill of listening to ourselves while we practice, we can hear, find, and fix technical and musical mistakes as we increase tempo or notice things learned incorrectly. When you're practicing, don't play through the mistakes, which you'll notice because you're listening, unless you're practicing performing. Instead, Try out the following method for resolving them, following the acronym NIENTE, that musical direction to fade away to nothing, like we wish our mistakes would do. Note the mistake, starting the process of becoming a detective to determine what's wrong. Identify the kind of mistake and its cause. This is essential. 
Is it a wrong note? Incorrect rhythm? Musical mistake? Was the cause at the exact spot where things went wrong, or was the actual cause, rather than the symptom, somewhat earlier? A note, a beat, or even a measure before the pileup? Is the fingering problematic? Was the hand position causing a stumble? Was something mislearned? Was the section just unfamiliar or played too quickly? Explore the section at a slower tempo, giving yourself time to be curious about what's happening. Notice with your eyes. Memorize that little bit, one beat, two, bit, two beats, even a measure, watching your hands to see what's going on. Are you playing efficiently without jerkiness? Our hands and arms should already be preparing the next note as and after playing one. The music doesn't stop after one note, so neither should your body. Think. Take a moment not playing to decide on a strategy going forward. We have innumerable options for practicing. Which one will you use for this spot? What will it help you to accomplish? Execute your strategy. Evaluate how it goes and keep practicing until things are stable. Change strategies if it doesn't really work, repeating this detective work as needed until you're confident and enjoying playing without this particular mistake. Tool 11. Finally, practice performing, especially when you have a performance coming up. Play for your friends, family, imaginary people in the pews, whoever you like, and enjoy being free to play through your repertoire. If you can, record this and listen back when your ears aren't multitasking to see what else you might hear. So, your assignment. Try out each of these 11 tools on spots that actually need a little help in your practice. Don't try all of them in one day though, just one or two each day on sections of pieces where they're useful. When you start your next new piece, try out all parts together at a snail's pace, a tempo where you can comfortably read the next note to come and move smoothly without any kind of jerkiness, stumbling, or changing the beat. Yes, this can be quarter note equals two beats per minute, but have fun noticing things as you plod along. As ever, happy practicing. <laughs>